Initial plans called for this timepiece to be flown across the country to a, a little secluded ranch in North San Francisco, the North San Francisco Bay area of California. And there it was going to go to a location called Skywalker Ranch. After weighing the cost in, of moving the treasured artifact, it was decided that a sound engineer instead would be dispatched and flown into the Frankfurt, Kentucky location. The timepiece was not just any timepiece of not just any ordinary American. It was owned by one of America's most beloved and respected leaders, and actually it was one of several that he owned. Whether or not it was purchased by the owner or whether or not it was given as a gift, it's unclear. What is clear is that it was a high-end, expensive piece, an expensive pocket watch during his day and purchased at Tiffany & Company. Its owner carried it during some of the most contentious years of our nation's history. While it faithfully kept time, it was a reminder of the brevity of life and how quickly time passed. He carried this timepiece under heavy burden of some of the weightiest decisions that he had to make, and yet time still moved on. Also during personal tragedy, family tragedy, during his life, time still moved on. James chapter 4 and verse 14 reminds us that life is a vapor, and it was a constant reminder of that. 42 days after his election as to office, suddenly and without warning, his life was cut short. In a murderous plot to decapitate the federal government and take out some of its top leaders. Actually, they say that more Americans saw him in his death lying in state at about 1.5 million Americans than probably saw him during his lifetime. And for the next 150 years or so, that timepiece sat silent, unwound, unused, passed down from family and friends. That all changed in 2012, when the much-anticipated arrival of the Hollywood sound engineer finally arrived. Under sworn secrecy, the guest was escorted into the vault of the Thomas Clark Center for Kentucky History. And for the next three years, or the next three years, the next three hours, that watch, that pocket watch, was placed in a special felt line box for noise reduction, and a dozen sound recordings were done. Why, you ask, were a dozen sound recordings done? Well, the recordings were done at the request of the movie director, Steven Spielberg, who wanted to make his new movie, Lincoln, to be as authentic as possible. And in that movie, that timepiece, the sound from that timepiece can be heard. You know, Lincoln's nomination, many believe, as a presidential candidate, and then later on elected president, was nothing short of a miracle. And I happen to believe, when I teach history, that God providentially works in history. And God is the one that forms and molds and prepares men and women for service for him. It all started back in May of 1860 when about 10,000 Republican supporters came to Chicago, Illinois to cram into a newly built convention hall there in Chicago, Illinois, nicknamed the Wigwam. And all of those party faithful came in, and they were there to nominate their candidate for president in 1860. Well, William Seward was considered to be the leading contender. He was the leading candidate. Everyone said, hands down, William Seward is going to get the nomination. He certainly has experience. He's been governor uh, twice, twice elected governor. He served in the United States Senate for 12 years. Many in the press consider him a statesman. He's already ha he already has delegates that, have com that are committed to him. 
In fact, he's so confident about his potential nomination that his campaign advisor advised him to take a six-month trip of Europe in this election year. And he follows that advice. And he's welcomed around Europe by different leaders who believe they're talking to the next president of the United States. This is an image of Harper's Weekly that shows all of the possible potential candidates that might be, whose names might be put into nomination. And as you see there, William Seward is prominently placed right in the center because he's believed to be the hands-down favorite. The vote was just a mere formality. It was a foregone conclusion. And then there was what Lincoln biographer Doris Kearns Goodwin called the night of a thousand knives. It was a night before the balloting would take place, a night before the actual vote at the convention. And it also became suddenly a night of deal making. It was a night some people called of backstabbing where people started second-guessing whether or not William Seward could actually win the election, if he could carry enough states, if he could carry the border states. They wanted a candidate that would win the presidency. It was also a night some committed delegates turned on their party favorite, William Seward, instigated primarily by a disgruntled Horace Greeley, who you can see is the founder and the leading editor of the New York Tribune, a man who was a little embittered that he had, hadn't been given a political job and political patr patronage earlier by Seward and others in the New York political machine. So now the second guessing began. And the next day, after the first ballot, after the second ballot, and the third ballot rolls around, William Seward's delegates watched as support for their candidate slowly began to erode until Abraham Lincoln was selected to be the party's nominee in 1860. He was everyone's second choice, and yet he's an improbable candidate, very unlikely, and then who is this guy from Illinois that is now the nominee? And ironically enough, uh, he was able to run in that election that fall. He was one of four candidates that are on the ballot that year. He wins less than 40% of the popular vote which you can't win an election today with only 40% of the popular vote. He wins no southern states, yet he's elected as our 16th president of the United States. You know, over, it's estimated that over 15,000 books plus have probably been written on Abraham Lincoln. Everything imaginable has been said. If you go to Washington, D.C., across from Ford's Theater, there is a building called the Ford's Theater for a Center for Education. And inside that building, they have a tower of books in tribute to Abraham Lincoln with about seven, nearly 7,000 books in this tower that represent and give you an idea of the number of books that have been written about Abraham Lincoln. 7,000 out of possibly over 15,000 have been written on the man. Everything's been written. Over, it's over eight feet in diameter and it's goes three and a half stories tall in that building. Much has been said about Abraham Lincoln. Opinions greatly vary between scholars and historians about Abraham Lincoln's religious views. And in some cases, they even seem to contradict each other. He never became a member of any organized church, though he attended church. His statements as a young adult are skeptical, and he's very suspicious of organized religion and Christianity. However, his opinions in his middle age begin to change. And as president, he probably said publicly and wrote more about religion and spirituality than any other president in American history. But I happen to believe that he was searching for the truth. And so this morning I'd like to just highlight what I believe are some things that we can take away from the life of Abraham Lincoln, some lessons that we can learn. And I think the first lesson that's pretty obvious is don't live in the past. Let's say, for instance, we take a look at this candidate, Abraham Lincoln, here and ask ourselves the question, do you think Abraham Lincoln would be elected today in today's climate? 
and stop and think about how we've seen politics change in recent years. We have 24-hour news channels. We have competing news channels. We have everything that is reduced down to short sound bites where candidates are forced to give what they believe in short sound bites. Social media. I've had the privilege of seeing presidential candidates and presidents in person and the entourage and the, the press corps that follows them is with them constantly. But could Abraham Lincoln get elected today? Well, if we take a look at his personal life, we know that at this time he's 51 years of age. He's six foot four. He towers as a giant among men back during his day. He's tall. Some people refer to him as lanky. He doesn't have the, the great looks like we expect our, our, our candidates to have today, almost like celebrities. He has this coarse, unruly hair, and he's a relatively unknown guy outside of Illinois before this. He's grown up in poverty. We admire him for that. We also find out as a young man he suffered from probably a nervous breakdown and had periods of early depression. We also find out that perhaps his wife suffers from some mental illness, historians believe. And they've also had a child, Willie, that has passed away earlier, and they went through that grief. We take a look at his education and his job resume. Well, we find out he has no college education. He has probably less than two years of formal, formal schooling altogether in his life. And he's taught himself, he's read, he's a voracious reader. We know that he's had his hand in numerous jobs, and he's also failed as a business owner. We take a look at his political career. Well, maybe his political career is a little better. Maybe this gives us hope here that he's going to be a sure candidate to win. And yet we find out that he's lost five out of the seven elections that he's run in on the state level and the federal level. Five out of seven. It's not a great track record. He has no executive experience. We expect our leaders to have some executive experience, normally. But he's never been a governor. He's never led men. The Eastern Press has called him a third-rate Western lawyer. They've called him a rustic country simpleton. And they said he's a man who can't speak good grammar. Lincoln has encountered many setbacks and many trials in his life. And yet each of them could have been an excuse to quit and to give up and not to have a vision and not to have a goal, but he doesn't. He's been rejected by his peers. He's been rejected by voters numerous times. And yet Lincoln is reported to have said, I walk slowly but I never walk backward. You know, Lincoln in time began to believe that God, and you see this in some of his statements, that God and not man had orchestrated the events that led to his nomination and later election as president. And he begins to ask himself later, well, maybe I was elected for a reason. And he later comes to see that he can be the great emancipator and that he can do something good and make a difference. You know, I have a question for us. What kind of failures or setbacks have you faced? What kind of failures or setbacks, setbacks are you currently facing? The other question that I would ask each of us is, what are you going to allow Satan to use to discourage you and defeat you? Have you lost the job? Have you been demoted at a job? Are you bitter, upset, and confused? Have you failed in your marriage? Do you have anger and resentment and regret? Do you feel like you failed as a parent? Do you have regrets? Have you lost a loved one or family member or friend in this life and you're bitter at God? Do you have broken relationships with your friends, some of your friends or former friends and family? Do you have unfulfilled goals or dreams? You know, we have to put off these past hurts and, and failures. We're reminded in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. If anyone had reason, 
to look back and be discouraged from his past. Obviously, we know Paul was a persecutor of the church. And yet Paul says, I can't look back. I've got to look forward towards Christ. What kind of things are, are you living with? Suffering bankrupts us sometimes. And I think in the life of Lincoln, it does. It makes us in time more dependent on God, doesn't it? And we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, Paul says, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We also know that suffering and trials sometimes strengthen us and allow us later to be of comfort and aid and assistance to someone else who goes through the same valley. We know from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul said, who comforteth us in all of our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. Don't live in the past. Seek forgiveness. What better, what better day than today to get freedom? Seek forgiveness. Seek reconciliation if needed. Claim the promises of God and move on. Lesson number one, don't live in the past. Don't get stuck in the past. Don't allow Satan to use it to discourage you. I think another lesson that we can glean from the life of Lincoln is that Lincoln would tell us not to live with unforgiveness. You know, Lincoln had quite an ability to look past people's faults, people's wrongdoings, and to forgive them. A number of years ago, there was a book written and I pulled some of my source material from this book, Team uh, of uh, Rivals, written by Doris Kearns Goodwin, which I referenced earlier. And in that book, she talks about the remarkable ability that, Link, that Lincoln did. Lincoln did something that no one thought he would do. He asked some of the same men who ran against him that thought they were better suited to be president, he asked them to come and be part of his cabinet. He had no ego. He humbly asked them to come and serve. And so he could glean from their advice. And he, in fact, some of these men are men that were quite harsh to him earlier. If you stop and think about uh, one instance in the 1850s, and these are both images from both of these individuals in the 1850s. Lincoln's hired, we're told, to represent a client. He does the work. He's paid. He prepares the brief. He shows up in court. He travels and shows up in court only to find out that his client has hired another group of lawyers to handle the case, and they hadn't even bothered to tell him. And one of those lawyers was a guy named Edwin Stanton, and he, he snubbed Lincoln. He said, where did that long-armed baboon come from? Stanton said he didn't want to associate himself with that long-armed ape. Snubbed Lincoln. You and I would remember that, wouldn't we? But six years later, Abraham Lincoln, when he's elected president, he needs a secretary of war. And people thought he was crazy when he decided to ask Edwin Stanton to come on board and be his secretary of war. And a man that came to grow and love Abraham Lincoln very dearly. Lincoln chose to overlook the offense earlier and saw Stanton's talents and abilities and looked past what he had done and decided not to hold a grudge. Don't live with unforgiveness. There's another instance where in 1861, Abraham Lincoln and William Seward show up at George McClellan's home to offer him the position of leadership of the Army of the Potomac, the top Union Army in 1861. They got there. They found out that McClellan wasn't at home, so they said, that's fine, we'll wait. And Seward and Lincoln sat in his parlor and waited for Seward to get home. Seward comes home, goes upstairs, and they wait, and they wait. And then a servant comes down and said, Mr. McClellan will not be taking visitors today. And he's retired to bed. Imagine the President of the United States is sitting in your living room and wants to see you, and you decide to go to bed. And but what does Lincoln do? Lincoln just shows up the next day and offers him the same position where some people might have held a grudge and said, well, that's fine. That says a lot about the man. And, you know, Abraham Lincoln was very patient with General McClellan. And he is general and given that position early on. And 
He doesn't act like Lincoln wants him to act, and later Lincoln relieves him of his duties. And in fact, McClellan thinks he's so well suited to be president, he runs against Abraham Lincoln in 1864 and loses. But General McClellan, Lincoln overlooked General McClellan's offenses. You know, there's another instance where one guy that he, he uh, uh, had come and be part of his cabinet, Salmon Chase, one of the guys that ran against him for president, he undermined Lincoln privately during his time in office and really, in fact, sought to have Lincoln replaced in 1864 for re-election. It was brought to Lincoln's attention, and Lincoln just simply shrugged it off and said, oh, he has White House fever, as if it's nothing. Just let him be. He has the White House fever. And he later leaves the administration, but what does Lincoln do a little bit a few years later when the, the job that Chase wanted badly and would love to have had came open, and Abraham Lincoln later appointed him to the U.S. Supreme Court as a chief justice. He forgave him. He didn't hold the way that Chase treated him against him. So I come back and I ask us this question directly. Are you living with unforgiveness? Do you dress up the outside? Do you have everyone fooled? You're, you're dressing up the outside and you're fooling everyone around you but God. And the book of Proverbs reminds us that we know our own bitterness. The heart knows its own bitterness. Are you living with something that you need to let go of this morning? Do you have some unresolved hurt? You know, Ephesians reminds us that we need to let bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from us. Has someone else wronged you? We say, yes, I didn't do anything to them, but they wronged me, and they need to ask me for forgiveness. But you're holding it as a grudge, and it's unforgiveness. And you need to let it go as a child of God. The Lord tells us that he won't forgive us if we're holding ought and we're against another brother or another person. And he won't forgive us until we make that right. The Lord enables us as a child of God to have victory. That's the one thing that we have that the sun saved world doesn't have is that ability to be able to forgive. And it's by God's grace that we do it. And what better way than to have freedom today than to handle that issue of unforgiveness and that grudge that you're holding. Don't live in your past. Don't live with unforgiveness. And then I think the big one, Lincoln would say, at the end of his life, if we asked him, I think he would say, don't live neglectful of salvation. Lincoln's life, I believe, is really a journey, searching for the truth. And I think his life can really be broken down into various stages you can take a look at his early years, and in his early years, his mother, Nancy Hanks, has a huge impact on him. She's the one that taught him about the Bible. She's the one that quoted to him passages of Scripture. This is where he get, gets his early religious training and his familiarity with Christianity. His parents are Baptist. They attend frontier campaign, campaign meetings back in the early days. Lincoln said later in life that he could still remember his mother's voice and his mother's tone, quoting those passages of Scripture and those things that she taught him. Unfortunately, when Lincoln was nine years of age, his mother contracts something called milk sickness, and it was from eating bad meat or drinking milk from cows that had eaten the snake root plant. And she, gets, uh, she comes down with milk sickness and suffers for some time and later passes away. She's 34 years of age at the time. And Lincoln is just nine years of age, but that, those early years were formidable in teaching him the Bible. Then you have the New Salem years, and this is when Abraham Lincoln was in his 20s. And it's, he moved away for the very first time at the age of 22 years of age, and he's out on his own. He works various jobs. And it's also a time of questioning for Lincoln, where Lincoln takes what he's been taught and he starts to question it and, and debate it. And he actually joined a group of friends that had their own little debate group, and they read uh, authors like Thomas Paine and Robert Frost and some men that were skeptics or deists. And Lincoln really starts debating religion and God's existence at this time. He's searching for the truth. And then you have the, prayer, uh, the Springfield years, from 1837, 1837 to 61. And this is really a time of great 
political failures for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we know during these Springfield years, in the early years there, he marries Mary Todd in 1842. In 1844, he goes into a law practice with a gentleman by the name of William Herndon. You know, William Herndon's accounts of Abraham Lincoln's religious views are oftentimes quoted by historians. Now, if you take a look at what Herndon heard Lincoln say and what uh, Lincoln said and wrote and talked about at that particular time period in his life, those, might, those were Lincoln's opinions. But to take that period of his life and then to say, and Lincoln considered himself really an authority on Lincoln's religious views, to say later that he didn't change his mind about some of those things is wrong. This is a very specific time period in Lincoln's life. But Herndon downplays Lincoln's religious views. Then in 1850, at 41 years of age, Abraham Lincoln and uh, Mary Lincoln's son, Eddie, passes away, Come, dies from tuberculosis. And it hit the family very hard. And there in um, Springfield, Illinois, Mary's pastor, Dr. James Smith, does the ceremony, the the uh, funeral service of Eddie. And it's at this time that Abraham Lincoln began to get a little close and got closer to uh, Pastor Smith there, Dr. Smith. In fact, Dr. Smith wrote a book back at, the, back at that time called The Christian's Defense. It was a book on apologetics. And Abraham Lincoln took that book and he read it and he picked it apart and he thought about it and he analyzed it. And I think it's further evidence that Abraham Lincoln was thinking more about Christianity, about the evidences of Christianity, and also thinking more about eternity. And then we have the White House years. And these are, of course, a time of very severe trial for Abraham Lincoln. The Civil War erupts. One year into the Civil War, with mounting casualties, Lincoln is searching for a competent general to take lead. Criticism of his administration is mounting. And then in early February 1862, their 11-year-old, Willie Lincoln, became sick. Willie was a very cheerful boy, very outgoing. He had a great love for railroads, and Lincoln did what he could to, to teach him and show him a lot about railroads. He was obsessed with railroads. Actually, young Willie said that one day he wanted to be a preacher and attended church there with his parents there in Washington, D.C. But Willie becomes ill and contracts what we believe to be typhoid fever, which he would have contracted from contaminated water. And he has a high fever. He runs a high fever and, and painful cramps and vomiting and delirium. And he suffers for about 19 days. And then on the 20th of February, Willie Lincoln died the second of Lincoln's children to die. And I can't even imagine the grief of having lost a child. Lincoln says this was perhaps the most difficult personal crisis that he had ever faced. I think it was an instrumental event in Abraham Lincoln's life where God got his attention even more. On Thursday following Lincoln's, Willie's death, Lincoln went to the green room where his body had laid and stayed there, and he shut off the green room and mourned. And in fact, several Thursdays thereafter, he would go into the green room and shut the doors and mourn the loss of his son. They never really got over. In fact, his wife never, ever get really got over Willie's death. But I think it could be said about Willie's death, a couple things. A couple things could be said. I think it broke Lincoln and humbled him like never before. He said, that blow overwhelmed me and it showed me my weakness as I have never felt it before. I think it was a, a pivotal event in Abraham Lincoln's life. And I think it also allowed Lincoln in a new, profound, and personal way to identify with the sorrows of families who were losing loved ones during the Civil War and allowed him to identify on an even greater level you know, for the next one and a half years, Lincoln continues to search spiritually. They attended the New York Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. If you go to Washington, D.C., right behind the White House today, this is what the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church looks like. It's within walking distance of the White House there. 
and the Lincolns attended uh, New York Avenue. And Lincoln began to bond more and more with Dr. Phineas Gurley there, the pastor at New York Avenue. The Lincolns rented a pew, which was oftentimes the custom. They rented a pew for $50 a year, and there attended, and there sat the Lincolns on the 14th pew. Lincoln sometimes sat in Dr. Gurley's study. He didn't want to come in and cause a commotion with his presence as President of the United States, and so sometimes instead of slipping in the pew, he would go in the pastor's study and crack the door open and sit and listen and take in the sermon. We also know that he also attended midweek services there at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. A fellow parishioner at New York Avenue said that after Willie's death, that Lincoln had a, quote, new quality about his demeanor, close quote. You know, and after victories at Gettysburg, miraculously and thankfully, uh, certainly on Lincoln's behalf there in the summer of 1863, the Union Army finally was winning some battles. They won Gettysburg in July. Vicksburg also surrendered in July. And Lincoln is persuaded, and later on, he issues an order in November of 63 to issue a national day of thanksgiving. And it's the national day of thanksgiving that we celebrate. Just before Thanksgiving of 1863, Lincoln's asked to come and dedicate a national cemetery at Gettysburg to give a few remarks. He wasn't even the featured speaker. You would figure the President of the United States would be the featured speaker that day, but he wasn't. The guy that was the featured speaker, the keynote speaker, was a guy by the name of Edward Everett. And guess how long he talked? He talked for two hours. Can you imagine sitting through a two-hour speech? And they said that he went on, really without notes, for two hours. And following that, it was Lincoln's turn to speak. And Lincoln got up to speak and started speaking and in fact the photographer didn't even have time to move his camera and to set up and take a picture because by the time Lincoln got started Lincoln was done and we know that he gave that famous speech the Gettysburg Address 272 words that we remember we don't really remember anything of Edward Everett's but we remember Lincoln's Gettysburg Address but I think seeing those thousands of graves at Gettysburg had a profound another profound impact on Lincoln you know, there's a statue of Lincoln that sits in Washington Cathedral in Washington, D.C. The sculptor is a guy by the name of Herbert Spencer Houck. And Mr. Houck said that his grandfather told him when he was a young man that he saw Lincoln at Gettysburg. His grandfather was a veteran at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was present at the day that the Gettysburg Address was given. And he reported that he saw Lincoln kneeling in some leaves near the battlefields of Gettysburg. Was he praying for his son, Tad, who back in Washington, D.C. was sick? We don't know. Was he just praying in general? Could have been. Was he praying for salvation? Was he praying for repentance? You know, these are all questions we can ask ourselves and they're uncertain, we don't have a definitive answer. We know that Lincoln later told an Illinois man that visited the White House later that year if he loved Jesus. And President Lincoln said, when I left home, meaning Springfield, I was not a Christian, but when my son died, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and I looked at our dead heroes, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. And he said, yes, I love Jesus. Dr. Phineas Gurley, the, the Lincoln's pastor there at New York Avenue, said in the latter days of his chastened and weary life, after the death of his son Willie and his visit to the battlefield of Gettysburg, he said with tears in his eyes that he had lost confidence in everything but God and that he now believed that his heart was changed. It was his intention soon to make a profession of religion. Lincoln also told a, later, a, a lady later from Brooklyn, New York, that he had had 
a change of heart and told her that at some, uh, he said, I can safely say that I know something of that change of which you speak, and I will further add that it has been my intention for some time at a suitable opportunity to make a public religious profession. Another parishioner there at New York Avenue said her pastor, Dr. Gurley, said that Lincoln had made plans to make a public uh, profession of faith on Easter morning of that year. And of course, some of you know what happened on Good Friday. Good Friday was the day that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater. Another friend of the Lincolns, Mr. Noah Brooks, who was a friend of the Lincolns, and a journalist and later Lincoln biographer said, I've had many conversations with Mr. Lincoln in which were more or less of a religious character. He freely expressed himself to me as having a hope of blessed immortality through Jesus Christ. Was Abraham Lincoln converted? Perhaps. And as I always say, only God knows the heart, just like God knows our heart. But I think there's evidence that indicates there were two catalysts, two events that God used according to his own words and the accounts of others, his son's death and then the visit to Gettysburg there in 1863. Was he converted somewhere between the time of 62 and 63? I think there's a good chance that evidence might show that that may be true. Don't live your life neglectful of salvation. We know in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 it says, how shall we neglect so great a salvation? Second, Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Today is the day of salvation. Your good works are not going to save you. They didn't save Lincoln. Lincoln had a lot of religious talk, and he makes a lot of uh, references to the Bible and God and Christianity, but those don't save him. The religious vocabulary doesn't save him. The good works, the compassion, the forgiveness, all of those things had no bearing. He was lost and on his way to hell like anyone else. His church attendance didn't save him. And your church attendance is not going to save you. And your good works and your charity are not good works. You know, recently we had at our church a young, uh, a young man who had been attending our church with his wife, who's a Christian, for quite some time, for weeks and months. And just recently, he called our pastor and said, it's time. And he trusted Christ as his Savior. And maybe perhaps there's someone that's sitting in Lighthouse here this morning. You've been attending Lighthouse with someone else for some time. Or maybe you're a first-time visitor this morning, but you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you have been searching like Abraham Lincoln was searching for the better part of his life. Maybe God has used circumstances in your life to get your attention, arrest your attention. He drew you here this morning to hear the sound of the gospel and if someone from lighthouse had an opportunity to open up god's word they would share with you that you're a sinner romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says we've all have sinned and come short of the glory of god they would also take you to a passage in the scriptures that shows you that there is a penalty for your sin romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death they would take you to a passage that says Jesus Christ paid your penalty. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a free gift. You know, Titus 3, verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. If someone from Lighthouse had an opportunity to take you to another passage of scripture they would take you to romans chapter 10 and verse 9 and 10 that says if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and believe in thine heart that god hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved are you living with are you living in the past are you living defeated are you living with unforgiveness are you bitter unhappy and as I said earlier, it's Patriotic Sunday where we stop and think about our country, we rejoice, we thank God for the great freedoms that we have in this country. But I can't think of a better morning than to let go of some of the bitterness and the hurt that perhaps that you are personally going through to leave it at the altar and leave it to God and to turn that over. And what about if you're here this morning 
and you're, you've been living neglectful of salvation, searching for truth. I can't think of a better day than Patriotic Sunday to make that right before God. Today, you need to get freedom. Today, you need to get freedom. And you'll never know when your time will come to an end. Pastor, let's bow our heads and close our eyes.